Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I am obviously not Peter Symes, uh, SIPTI's uh, Director of Standards and Engineering. I'm filling in for him today, so you'll pardon the Brooklyn accent instead of the British accent. Let's see if I get this thing to work. Okay. Uh, here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I want to give you some background on SIMTI, give you some idea of how we do our standards development, uh, talk about what we're doing now at recently released standards, and then some of what's on the horizon. The Society was established in October 1916 as a Society of Motion Picture Engineers. In 1950, uh, television was added, so we put the T in, the uh, Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. The Society's founder was a gentleman named C. Francis Jenkins, uh, the man who developed the first practical motion picture projector. And incidentally, sorry, am I not getting close enough? Okay, thanks. Also, who uh, coincidentally is the first man to hold a uh, commercial television broadcasting license, which he was issued by the Federal Radio Commission in 1928. Simpty's goal is to be the leader in the advancement of the art, science, and craft of the image, sound, and metadata ecosystem. We do this through a dedication to membership, education, and standards. Our membership is global. We have over 6,000 individual members, 230 corporate members. Uh, we're in 64 countries, and we have 27 sections around the, around the world. If you count the little red dots, you'll see there aren't 27 of them. There's 24, because some of the sections are so close together, they overlap. That's where our sections are. There is, in fact, a section here in New York, one of the largest ones in the society. These are the three pillars of SIPTI, membership, standards, and education. Um, I have been involved in all three, uh, but today we're going to focus on standards. Our standards development activities, SIMTI is an accredited standards developing organization. We are accredited by the American National Standards Institute. Uh, we are, you know, I'm going to pick this thing up because I can't keep leaning over. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, we are recognized by ISO, IEC, and the ITU. ISO and IEC are two international standards bodies, the International Organization for Standardization, the International Electrotechnical Commission, and the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, which is a branch of the United Nations. SIPTI is one of the five founders of the Advanced Television Systems Committee. We have over 400 standards, recommended practices, and engineering guidelines. Actually, I'd be willing to bet it's over 500 at this point. Uh, I didn't actually have a chance to count. We have, these really should be called liaisons and partnerships. If you look at the various organizations here, um, the ATSC, AES, Video Services uh, Foundation, um, European Broadcasting Union, uh, the Canon Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the um, Entertainment Technology Cooperative, the Consortium, rather, Digital Sim Initiatives, uh, the, American, the Advanced Media Workflow Association, ITUR, Radio Communication Sector, and Telecom Sector. Uh, ISO, IEC, you have a joint technical committee that is the parent of both MPEG and JPEG. And we communicate with all of these organizations and work cooperatively with them in developing our standards. Standards are developed in SIMTI by what is called the Standards Community, which is a subgroup of SIMTI. Uh, if you're familiar with the IEEE Standards Association, it's a similar kind of a thing. Uh, just because you're a SIPTI member doesn't put you in the standards community. Uh, you have to express an interest, be willing to do some work, and there's also a fee you have to pay, which covers the cost of the meetings and facilities and things like that. It's relatively small. Uh, the work is overseen by uh, the standards VP uh, and a standards committee, which is made up of the chairs of the various technology committees and some other folks. Uh, under the technology committees, there are working groups, project groups, those actually develop standards, study groups which produce reports analyzing requirements for standards, and task forces which are joint um, cooperative efforts between SIPTI and other organizations. We have one running right now with uh, the Video Services Forum. Uh, the members of our standards community are individuals, not companies. Many standards developers have company representation. ATSC does that, CEA does that. Within SIMTI, we work as individuals, although we recognize we are sponsored by employers or by uh, firms that require, uh, that uh, engage us as consultants. We have uh, a quarterly meeting cycle. The next one's coming up in December, uh, where all the technology committees and various of the working groups and project groups 
We'll hold meetings in sequence over the course of five days. Um, in between those quarterly cycles, we work by web conference, uh, working groups, project groups, and those could be weekly or bi-weekly or as the work dictates. Some of the technology committees also meet out of cycle because they have an accelerated schedule they have to meet. The important thing to know is that if you would want to participate in these, although the meetings take place around the world, we always provide web conferencing facilities at the quarterly meetings so you don't actually have to travel. I will be participating in the Atlanta meetings from my uh, office at home. I don't have to travel to Atlanta to go. Uh, after the quarterly meetings, we produce a summary, which you can, it's publicly available. You can get to it. The link is right here, or as you can see, it is accessible from the homepage, simply.org, where that red circle is. And I'll give you some of the highlights of our work, and I say highlights because if I were to try to go through the entire list, we'd be here for a day. So we'll talk about video over IP, we'll talk about interoperable master format, and I'll explain what that is, video device control, and there are, I don't need to read the list to you, you can see what they are. For video over IP, these are the, the standards group is uh, ST2022. When you see ST, that means standard. RP means recommended practice, e.g. means engineering guideline. Um, the first one and the foundational one is, that, is the dash one, which is forward error correction for real-time video and audio transport over IP networks. It's recognized when you try to send this stuff over IP networks, the normal way of correcting errors is you say, oh, I missed a packet, and the packet's retransmitted. That doesn't work in real time. The best you can do is best effort, so we have to provide forward error corrections so in case there's no return path or there's no time for a return path. Then the next three standards talk about the unidirectional transport of various types of MPEG-2 transport streams. Uh, and then five and six, talk about high bitrate media transport streams, HD and above. And dash seven, which is a relatively recent standard, is high availability delivery. This is if you are delivering redundant streams through diverse paths, how you can code them so that you can fail over seamlessly from one stream to the other. This is a very important foundational standard. Interoperable master format was developed originally for the motion picture industry, although it is extensible beyond that. Um, it provides a single interchangeable master file format, um, minimizes the storage requirements because you only you restore a master file and then and the information you need to create different versions. So if you needed to create an English version and a French version with Spanish subtitles, all that information could be contained in one master file and you could derive the various, sub, uh, the various combinations you need from it so you get away from the combinatorial logic of having to save each individual version. Um, it allows for automation for downstream file transcoding, and it reuses existing standards where possible. It's loosely based on the, the SIMPTI Digital Cinema standards, which have a proven track record they're used every day. Um, and it provides interoperability by constraining some of the existing standards. The uh, IMF standards look, uh, IMF um, files look very similar to MXFOP1 files, except that they are XML-based. Uh, the whole series of standards is SIMPTI 2067. There is an hour-long PDA webcast that is available on the SIMPTI website. You can also search for it directly on YouTube. Uh, no charge, you can just go take a look at it. It's done by Annie Chang, who is the chair of the committee that developed the work. And there's a huge amount of information there if you are interested in this space. Media device control. Uh, this is a way to control media devices over IP networks. Think of it as a 21st century replacement for the old RS-422 control via software services. Uh, and the first two of these standards are complete. Uh, the second two are in the later, later stages of approval. And there will be more to come as we go down the road. Uh, this is being led by a group from ESPN who are trying to do this in their current, data, their current digital center and their new digital center. Uh, so it is being led by the user community, as was the last one, Andy Chang is with the Walt Disney Company. Generally speaking, um, there are both user and manufacturer participants in these, um, in these efforts, but user requirements come from users, they don't come from manufacturers. The reason I got involved in the SIMPTI process in the first place, in the standards process, was because as a user, I was having a problem with incompatibility between various and sundry devices back in the late 80s. Nobody was making key signals the same way. 
and I thought there ought to be a standard. So I came to a meeting and they said, hmm, that's a good idea, why don't you go write up a draft? So I went back to my office, wrote up a draft, came back the next day and I said, this is really good, now you're the chairman of a working group. Ask a question, get a job. But the standard's done. Actually, it's a recommended practice, it's RP 157, it's still in force. We just revised it last year. Uh, 10 gigabit per second fiber interfaces. Uh, this is the ST435 series. Uh, and you can see here what they are. We have the basic streams, then the data mapping and the optical fiber interface. And then building on that, there is simply 2036-3. The 2036 series standards are the ultra high definition standards. Dash three is the one that gives you the way to map uh, and a various HD signals into a single link or multi-link 10 gig serial signal data interface. You will also probably have heard about uh, mapping onto a hierarchy of six gigabit per second signals. I'll get to that in a minute. That's a different series of standards. High definition reference displays. This is a uh, project group that I lead. Believe it or not, there has never been a SIPTI standard to define the white point of a reference display. How bright it is and what the chromaticity is. We talk about it for the source image formats. We say D65. But there's not, never been a standard that says the white point should be D6500 and give you that in XY coordinates. And there's never been one that says you shall use this luminance level. The luminance level we have settled on is 100 candelas per square meter, which is equivalent to 30 foot Lamberts, or almost, 30, almost equivalent to 30 foot Lamberts. It's very close, within 5%. Uh, there also has never been a recommended practice for how to measure this. The standard is an advanced stage of completion. We are in the process of resolving about two dozen comments. And the recommended practice is almost ready for ballot. So we're making progress, and then we will move on to the other documents. We originally started working with the reference displays and the reference viewing environment, and discovered that what users really needed was a standard for a white level. So again, driven by users. Uh, Simply time text. This one has become extremely important with the FCC mandate that anything that's ever been captioned on the air, if you put it on the internet, the captions have to go with it on the internet. The safe harbor for internet captions is Simply time text. Because of the importance of these standards to the community in general, we make these available for free download from the Simply website. The rest of our standards we charge for. This one's available free. The link is there. If you're involved, at all involved in this space and you need a solution to your problem, I really urge you to go take a look at these standards. Um, there is also a, um, a study group on ultra high definition television, uh, which has been working furiously to find where the holes are in our, in our standards, what needs to be filled in. The report is available again directly on our website. Uh, you can link to it from the home page. Or uh, you can get it at the link on the bottom of this page. However, um, if you're interested in this topic, next Thursday, November 21st, uh, the Sydney New York section will be meeting at Columbia University. It's a joint meeting with the IEEE Broadcast Technology Society and Society for Information Display New York chapters. I will be presenting the program. I will be presenting a summary of the report that was released at IVC, which is the one that is linked here and I will be filling in with some recent developments since then. So if you're interested at all, please go to SimptyNY.org, register for the meeting so we know how much food to buy, and come. Let's talk a little bit about what's on the horizon. Let me check my time. I think I can slow down a bit. Um, we have a few more things to talk about. Um, high frame rates. This gets to be rather interesting. Uh, understudy for digital cinema, we're looking at 96, 100, 120 frames per second. For UHD TV, we're looking at 120 to 300 frames per second. The key thing here is that the spatial resolution increases, temporal resolution must increase as well. Take a look at the picture, you'll see what I mean. Let me walk around in the front here. I just wanted to see how well this is showing up on the screen. Yeah, it is. All right. And if the mouse pointer works on this, yeah. Okay, I want you to take a look up here in the trees. Now, this on the right-hand side is 
50 frames per second with a 50% shutter angle, which is typical. On the left-hand side, we're 100 frames per second with a 33% shutter angle. The important thing to note here is these were both shot at the same time with the same camera. Um, what we have is a series of frames that were shot at 300 frames per second. The 100 frame per second material was t derived by taking one frame, then two frames of black, then another frame, then two frames of black, dropping the frames in between. The one on the right hand side is taken by taking, done by taking three frames, then three frames of black, then three frames of video, then three frames of black. The shutter on the 300 frame per second camera was effectively 100% duty cycle. So this is an exact simulation of what you would get if you use these cameras at these, in other words, the derived streams are identical to what you would get if you shot them in data mode this way. But if you look at the sign that says visitor parking, you can read it clearly on the left, you can't read it on the right. If you look at the detail on the leaves of the trees, on the right hand side it's gone. If you look at the roadway, on the left side it's clearly gravel, on the right hand side it could be gravel, it could be McAdam, it's impossible to tell. This is because the camera is panning with the bicyclist, so the whole background gets blurred. If I were to lock the shot, the background would be clear, but the bicyclist would be, would be blurred. The important thing to note here is the more spatial resolution I have, the higher the temporal resolution I need in order to be able to avoid this smear, because otherwise I'm just giving you lots of smeared pixels. In fact, some testing has been done on this, um, and I'll talk about it next Thursday. Uh, it appears that the higher frame rate is a lot more important than the higher spatial resolution in terms of image quality. Okay. More on that next Thursday if you want to come. Uh, this is another issue. LED light, and by the way, the, um, the text that's here is taken directly from the project page, which you can also find on the Simpty site for this particular project. The problem is that LEDs are not broad spectrum sources like an incandescent lamp. This presents huge problems because cameras don't see exactly the way our eyes do. So you may think you've got one color when you look at the set. When you shoot it with the camera, it comes out completely different. So we need to be able to put a metric on this. And the, there are two metrics that that's, are going to be developed here. The first one is a tele television lighting consistency index. And the second one is a television lighting matching factor. The existing thing that you see on LED bulbs now or, or fluorescent bulbs now is called the color rendering index, not suitable for the kind of work that we do. Maybe for somebody at home, and there's some questions about that, but for, for the kind of work that we do where we're actually trying to capture images, that number is effectively useless. So once we have these things documented, then it'll be possible to develop better, more accurate light sources with LEDs. Now let's talk about immersive image formats. And I'm not talking about just spatially immersive. I'm talking about extended dynamic range or high, high dynamic range. What if you had a display that could reproduce light levels up to 10,000 nits? That would be about 3,000 foot lamps and had a really wide color gamut. Well, it turns out Dolby decided they were going to try some experiments with this. So what they did was they took a digital cinema projector and dumped the entire output of it into a 20 inch display screen. You can get really high light levels that way. And they found some interesting things. The first one is the electrical optical transfer function, what we call gamma. It turns out that the gamma law for at these works, the re reason we have gamma is because it was a function of CRT phosphorus. We had to come up with a function that was an inverse of the way CRT phosphorus worked. It turns out to be a really useful thing as well. We'd have had to invent it if CRTs didn't need it. But it is not an ideal function to use for matching human perception over very broad ranges of light levels. So we needed to find something else that's based on human perception, not based on gamma, particularly since we don't use CRTs anymore. The last phosphor-based display was a plasma display, and those are going out of manufacture next year. The other thing that we need to do is define a way uh, of, coding the meta of coding metadata to describe the mastering display's color volume because when you get to these wide gamut and high output devices, not every display is going to be identical. The technologies will be different, the displays will be slightly different. We need a way of describing that because otherwise we won't be able to match images from one facility to the next. And thirdly, we need to define a color differencing for the 
XYZ color space, not little XY, big XYZ, which is what's used for digital cinema. Um, it's a much wider color space. Each of these tasks that you see here has a different project group assigned to it, all of which are about to start work. This, the, the um, work assignments, the project, the project tasks are in the process of being refined, should be approved at the December round of meetings, at which point these three groups will start work. So again, if you have an interest in this, um, it's something you might want to start following. And then we have, remember I mentioned before about the six gigabit uh, series of standards or hierarchy of standards. Um, right now, what we have been doing is every time we need more bandwidth, we define a new mapping function. That's ridiculous. Telecom people don't do this. What telecom people do is they'll sell you a virtual circuit, whatever bandwidth you need, and if they need to make it up by bonding multiple channels, they do that and they have techniques for making sure the packets all show up in the right order. We need to do that now also because with the SDI interfaces that we're looking at, supporting the high definition and particularly ultra high definition formats possibly in 3D, um, possibly with very high spatial resolution, we need a hierarchy of interfaces that go up. 24 is not the upper limit. If we go to ultra high definition, which is two, which is 8K by 4K, at 300 frames per second, 3D, the bandwidth we need is a terabit per second. That's the data rate. We are not gonna do that with an ad hoc method of just bonding channels. So we need to come up with a defined way to do that, and that's the purpose of this particular group, which again is just getting underway. So that's it for me. Ooh, I have six minutes for questions. Oh, are there any questions? Okay, then I'd like to ask a question. How many of you were SIFTI members? Shame on the rest of you. Because instead of try me trying to force feed you all of this information in a half hour, if you belong to the society, you could get this stuff on a regular basis. We do uh, Professional Development Academy webinars, one a month. I've alluded to a few of them earlier. You will be notified of, the, if you're a member, you get notified of those. You'll get our journal. You'll also get notification of section meetings. And as I say, the New York section here is extremely active. We have 10 meetings a year, nine of which are technical, one of which is a really good party. That'll be next month. And I'm not going to tell you where. You'll have to sign up to find out. But it's, it's simply news. If you sign up this year, it's $135 a year. If you wait till after January 1st, it'll be $145. Joel, do we have anybody here who's taking money? Here? Where's the Simply booth? Right next door. So if you're interested, go next door. Roberta will be happy to sign you up. If you don't want to be a full member with voting and all that kind of stuff, you can be an associate member next year. That'll be 45 bucks means you don't get the journal in print, you don't get some other things, cost you more for conferences, but uh, at least you'll be involved and you'll get on the mailing list. So um, I guess that's it for me. If you have questions for me, there's my email address. If you have further questions about the SIMTI Standards Program, I suggest you contact Peter Symes, SIMTI's Director of Standards and Engineering, and there's his email address. Thank you very much for coming.